you always talked about episode three being about leaving childhood behind for many of our characters, for Damon, for Rhaenyra, for Allison. How would you like to participate? I'm not sure why I must. Because you are my daughter. And you have duties. As I am ceaselessly reminded. Because of the nature of this story, because it was a generational conflict that was about war, we needed that time to plant those seeds and let them grow. And the only way to do that is to let time pass. We meet Viserys, he's got a son, Allison is pregnant, the war in the Stepstones is not going well. We understand that two or three years worth of material has happened in those couple of opening scenes. We tried to approach it in as practical a way as possible at the first time. And it was a good way of grounding the time jump. This was the first one where a substantial amount of time passes off screen, and we're just asking the audience to pay attention, listen, and play along and figure out what's gone on in the in-between. Here's to his grace on his second name day. These big royal hunts were another way to really show the decadence of this particular time. It's a major carnival that you set your calendar to that year. Since you came of age, I've been slowly drowning in a lake of parchment, and I have tried often to discuss it, but you've refused me at every turn. That is because I do not wish to get married. Even I do not exist above tradition and duty, Rhaenyra. Excuse me, Your Grace. Episode three is childhood's end. Rhaenyra feels the pressure to marry. Viserys realizes that he has to find and make order in his house, particularly when it comes to his brother, Damon, and Rhaenyra, his daughter. Rhaenyra does not want to get married. She also doesn't want to give her dad an excuse to just name Egg on the heir to the throne. She's so incredibly frustrated at being effectively a political pawn in her father's game that she needs to express it in some way, shape, or form. Rhaenyra is very rebellious, angry, and she's hurting more than she lets on. Rhaenyra has got to her wit's end and decides to take it in her own hands and run off. And obviously, Sir Kristen, as her sworn protector, has to go wherever she goes. Kristen Cole, who we set up a little bit in episode two, but now we understand that in three years of being her sworn protector, Cole and she have developed a close relationship. <laughs> Rhaenyra just has suppress a lot of anger, so she kind of just snaps. There's a real catharsis to her killing the boar, you know, how Rhaenyra is treated and boxed out of a man's world. The boar attack is the boiling over of Rhaenyra's frustration in the episode, and she takes out all of her aggressions about everything on the boar, but the whole camp gets pulled pork sandwiches after that. So at least it wasn't all loss. Before the dragons rolled over Westeros, White Heart was the symbol of royalty in these lands. And on this day of all days, the White Stag is the symbol of divine royalty from deeper kind of medieval lore and Arthurian tales. When the White Heart is sighted, it's such a rare sighting, and it's considered an incredible omen on Aegon's name day. It sets off a doubt in Viserys' mind that has been apparent for quite some time, which is, did I do the right thing in naming Rhaenyra heir? And that's really what plagues him throughout the episode. We know that Viserys is kind of prone to mythology and signs and dreams and symbolism. And to have that symbol put in front of him on this day where he's really secretly wondering whether he's made a wrong decision and then be forced to reckon with it on a dramatic level was a really interesting thing for us. So then when it turns out that it's not a white stag, but it's a brown one, his relief is palpable, but also in a funny way, there's disappointment that Sometimes these things aren't meant to be. Yeah! We are faltering and the Triarchy knows it. If King's Landing will not support Daemon, why should any of us? Blood or no, Faymond, I will not have you stoke mutiny. It's three years later and we see that this war is not going well. The men are fatigued, people are leaving, Daemon's leadership is causing a lot of dissension. When we meet them in episode three, the war is not going according to plan, and we're not seem to be getting anywhere. Damon reaches a point where he cannot afford to fail anymore, and now he has to prove himself. Damon goes to war for his own motives, essentially, because I think he wants to, and regardless of the consequences, because it gets his brother's attention. 
we wanted to show Damon's fighting style and his dynamism and his ability to move and think on the run. He fights in a sort of Damon-esque spirit, which is, so I don't care if I die, really. But we also wanted to be messy and have Damon fail and mess up. I was always very keen on the idea that you had to see him lose, and in doing that, winning on some level. Really, all of it is a suicide run, and it's kind of astonishing because at every point, Damon should die. It was really meant to be an anvil where Damon's character could be forged, and he could go into the battle and come out as a formidable force that had proven himself worthy of some reputation in Westeros. There's no way that story would not have ended with his death if not for the arrival of the cavalry. And that's the thing I like about it, is that he came there to die, and he really meets death in the face and is reborn. I think Matt did great. He was definitely in the war zones when he was doing this sequence. Damon emerging out of the cave with Crab Feeder's torso is the Damon that launches off for the rest of the season. Rhaenyra, Viserys, and Damon emerge out of episode three, reborn with new perspective on who they are and what their purpose is.